So the first speaker today is uh, Professor Martha Cleveland who is a professor in education innovation and soon to be honorary doctor here at Mid Sweden University. Welcome up. Honorable Vice Chancellor, distinguished administrators, faculty, staff, students, and guests, good morning. I am Dr. Martha Cleveland Innes. I am professor and program director of the Master of Education program in distance education at Athabasca University. I'm also the editor in chief of the Canadian Journal of Learning and Technology. I'm an instructional designer, an instructor, and a researcher. I research online and blended learning, MOOC development, um, the design and delivery of lifelong learning, and higher education reform. I am a former guest professor and visiting researcher at KTH Institute of Technology, and I'm currently a guest professor in the Department of Education here at Mid Sweden University. My academic background is first in behavior science and um, clearly education serves as a remedy for social and economic ills. I dedicate my professional effort to research and improved practice in education, especially teaching, learning and leadership. As learning is ubiquitous, a ubiquitous human behavior, my academic study turned to human behaviors in teaching and learning. Then enter the internet. Well, this adds a significant layer of complexity to many things, including teaching and learning. And so my academic study includes learning and teaching in technology enabled or technology enhanced learning spaces across a lifetime. I have a number of projects going on, a lot of plates spinning at the same time, which is common for academics in this very complex education space. My favorite project at the moment is the identification of hudagogy, which is the support for self-determined learning in blended and online learning such that that will translate into lifelong learning spaces. Um, we have funding to study such a thing, and we are identifying how that might work. I'm also um, on the research advisory board for Western Michigan University, and we're looking at the development and validation of observational and self-report instruments to describe teaching practices in online undergraduate STEM courses. Under most of my work rests a theoretical frame called the Community of Inquiry, first proposed by Garrison, Anderson, and Archer in 2000. The model's comprised of three presences, three ways of being required by teachers and students such that deep and meaningful learning experiences will emerge. I provided the empirical evidence in the first few tests and measurements of this model in the early 2000s. Extensive research has followed, and we support two websites, one that holds a repository of the research, and the second, which is a, a multi-authored blog, and the opportunity for researchers and practitioners who are using the model to talk to each other. We have some additional theoretical going, work going on at the moment, considering a fourth presence called emotional presence. Right now we have an international sample that we're analyzing and Mid-Sweden University teachers have um, participated in that sample. Our theoretical development and empirical testing of the community inquiry has led to a lot of application. We have evidence-based practice in the design and delivery of online blended and place-based teaching that supports technology enhanced learning. Um, past government research grants have supported this work resulting in two books, Teaching in Blended Learning Environments and a Guide to Blended Learning. 
both these books are Creative Commons license, licensed. You can buy them if you want a print copy to hold in your hand, but they are available uh, free of charge through the internet. The unique pedagogical imperatives of distance education are never far from our work in online blended and lifelong learning research and development. These are, to name a few, student-centeredness, flexible learning, and self-directed engagement, just to name a few. There appears to be some resurgence around this whole notion of distance education and its foundations. And Routledge has asked my co-editor and I, Randy Garrison, to um, update this book. And we're doing that now. It will be out again at the beginning of uh, 2000. So massive open online courses, or MOOCs, were first constructed by two Canadians. One um, was George Siemens, a colleague and a friend. This opportunity um, expanded accessibility and allowed participants across a lifespan to be involved, making MOOCs expansion of university education for lifelong learning. This innovation, though, has been fraught with challenges, and Athabasca University chose first to research this potential force before creating any opportunities. So with funding from the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation, we studied design and delivery options for these very large open courses. This is some of our results. That poster is available if you're interested, because I know it's too hard to read on the screen. It's our understanding and belief that online learning competence is now a critical piece of virtual citizenry and a valuable skill for lifelong learning. Athabasca's first MOOC is designed with novice online learners in mind, with an inquiry-based pedagogical model, steeped in new and old premises for distance education delivery. It is either self-paced and independent, or grouped and facilitated. The students may choose. Um, we're about to run our seventh offering of this MOOC, which has seen over 3,500 participants. Um, data on an ongoing basis has provided validation of our iMOOC, or inquiry-based pedagogy for large classes. Learning analytics help us to share our design and facilitation on an ongoing basis. So our success with this inquiry-based MOOC has led to a collaboration with the Commonwealth of Learning, an agency responsible for education development in countries all over the world. Our technology-enabled learning MOOC has reached over 11,000 participants, most of whom are teachers in the developing world. It's designed with and supports the development of open education resources. The MOOC material itself is Creative Commons license, meaning anyone can take this and use it. At the moment, um, it has been translated and is put to use in China, and we have requests now from Mexico and Yemen to do the same. So how are our MOOCs different? Well, we provide three levels of instructor presence to support learners and encourage development of a community of inquiry. First, we have um, a lead instructor that's usually an AU faculty member, and they provide a static presence via pre-recorded videos. Um, and in, um, in this way, they support the content and um, are, they support the content and provide the normal teaching that we would see on a regular basis. Then we have inspirers. Inspirers are in a layer of instruction where they start and end each week. They provide somewhat of a summary to say what's gone on. They acknowledge what, um, they acknowledge what the students have been doing. Then finally, we have facilitators whose main job is this, 
connect the students to one another so that they can support each other and provide networked um, communities for themselves, both within the course and beyond. Um, you, may under, you may know these three concepts. They make up what's called the Iron Triangle of Education. We must have, in order to have healthy society with sound education, um, high levels of accessibility, very high quality, and affordability slash cost effectiveness. Now, <laughs> from research that's been done by some of my colleagues, you can always have two of these, but never all three. And that's our challenge in education as we move into networked universities and a commitment to lifelong learning. We must continue to juggle and use the technology appropriately so that we can get to all three. I like the work of Trow. He says that an elite system of education is one where less than 15% of young people in society can attend higher education. A mass system, by contrast, allows for 50%. He is calling for universal systems. And at the moment, we have, across the globe, an average of about 62% participation. Well, if we consider the commitment to lifelong learning and the expansion of the need for education across the lifespan, that number for universal education is going to continue to, uh, to grow and we want it to be, well, as close to 100% as possible. This means um, considerable diversity. And Chong, I will identify his work because he has a unique definition of millennial learners, talking about um, the new generation of adult learners who will, um, of course, we will still have a majority of learners who are, who are young and making their transition into adulthood. That transition will grow across to, to higher numbers into 35 and 40, and we will also have the diversity that comes from offering lifelong learning. That means having participants in education that are of all ages. Um, this is a, you will have access to my slides. This is a reference that I encourage all of you to take a look at. It's the call for not just university lifelong education, but lifelong universities. Um, another plug for my new research, and I'd be happy to tell you more about this particular project. And finally, um, a reference to what Mid-Sweden University is doing here, which I find extremely exciting. Um, the goals listed here identify how progressive work at this university is. The, the commitment, particularly to make knowledge accessible throughout life, is something that um, I find very exciting. Um, and then finally, there are two projects here that you may know about, the, the ones that I am particularly excited for. <laughs> These are, so for Mid-Sweden, it's more than just written goals that actions are underway. Two progressive and very important projects here have really caught my attention, and I hope to be able to contribute to and offer support in some way to these projects. BUFFLE is the acronym is a project dedicated to developing a hybrid and networked educational framework for flexible lifelong learning. They want to answer the question, how can a hybrid and networked educational framework for lifelong learning at the advanced level of higher education be designed? Incredibly important question. Um, reaching for a hybrid and networked university through lifelong learning initiatives is the second project. The acronym is LAD, and there um, you will be exploring the university as an open space and as a partner for agents in the surrounding society. It's an honor and a privilege to play a small role in this progressive university. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions, remarks? 
we have time for maybe one or two questions. Raise your hand if you have any questions. Yeah, I wonder if uh, one part of it, of course, is in the lifelong learning, is the courses and the education. When it comes to validation, which I think in some way are a topic or an issue that we are need to in some way develop. Yeah, have you have been studying that kind of processes where you have MOOCs and so on? It seems like people can can learn and then they come to have validation in some way. Mm -hmm. Can you reflect on that? Yes, an, uh, an incredible question. Of course, we there there is non-formal learning and there is informal learning and there is formal learning and we do have to have a way for um, for accreditation to be supported at Athabasca University we have a vast structure for PLAR or prior learning assessment regulation so that of course is one opportunity in some of the MOOCs not ours at this point um, there there is the opportunity to take the MOOC and then provide further evidence of competence with cost, of course, um, with cost, and that provides credit for certain programs. So you can see the, your question being answered in a variety of different ways. In our MOOC for the developing world, there are two ways to complete. You may receive a certificate of participation if that's all you need, and you have to have completed a number of quizzes, have posted a number of times, um, and to get a certificate of participation. For a certificate of completion, you have to do the final assignment, which is the creation of an open education resource using technology for the classroom in K-12. to And that is a yet another level of validation for that learning. Some of the teacher training uh, regulators are now looking at that as a way to do a, a last level of measurement and give our participants accreditation credit for what they've done in the MOOC. C a critical question and something that does have to be designed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and here we have a gift from Mid Sweden University to you. Oh my. <laughs> so thank you thank once you. more. Thank you.